Order. And the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Social Development. And we'll start with listed questions. Uh, Mrs. Anna Lowe is not in her place. So I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Question number two, Principal Deputy Speaker. You will be aware that over recent years, my department has invested significant amounts to support the regeneration of Enniskillen Town Centre and to support local businesses. And that funding has not been used to establish any commercial business. Approval for branding, marketing and advertising campaign uh, for Enniskillen Town Centre was endorsed unanimously by Fermanagh District Councillors. The development of the Enjoy Enniskillen website was one element of a package of actions aimed at highlighting Enniskillen's role as a tourist destination and market town. Key elements of the project included adding vitality and vibrancy to the town, strengthening the strong independent retail offering, promoting Enniskillen's unique identity as an inland town, and maximising the town's tourism potential, making the most of its physical assets and geographical location. The development of the brand Enniskillen, a place apart, required an online presence. That website showcases Enniskillen Town Centre and gives a flavour through images of what the town has to offer in terms of attractions, services, events, arts and culture, history and heritage. It is appropriate to include images of services such as shopping, as they are a key part of what visitors in Enniskillen will want and need. It wasn't designed to compete with any existing business or shopping directories. I call Mr. Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I, I thank the uh, Minister for that. He, he actually strayed into uh, the, the issues around Enniskillen, which I suppose wasn't in the question, but uh, anyway, it's, it's of significant help. Uh, could the Minister tell me if there is a specific policy within his department that doesn't allow uh, funding from his department to complete, compete directly with a commercial business? Well, I suppose this comes down to questions of what constitutes a commercial business and what constitutes um, um, competition. Um, I'm sure the member would agree with me that uh, when Fermanagh District Council, as a council, and unanimously agreed that it was the um, right approach to have uh, a website of this type, the decision was taken uh, to, to uh, support that. Um, that's the specific example which the member has, of course, raised uh, previously. Um, the issue as to whether there is competition or not is one of which there will be various opinions as to whether it is or is not. Um, I'm not aware of any specific policy, um, but then I'm not sure and I don't accept that there is competition in this case, because in fact I understand that uh, the member may not want to go fully into all the details of that particular case, but uh, I think there is a linkage between the two websites. Thank you. And I call Mr. Trevor Clark. Uh, question number three. The Department is currently considering a number of options to manage the effect of the budget cuts. It is too early at this juncture to determine to what extent the present budget cuts will affect the South Antrim area in particular. Can I thank the Minister for the answer? I, mean, I know it's somewhat vague in terms of detail for South Antrim, but can the Minister outline in terms of this year um, what effect that the, you know, the ongoing problems with the budget will actually have uh, in the totality of his department? Um, the member raises uh, an issue that is very much in my mind, and I'm sure in the minds of a number of other ministers. Um, the fact is that a budget cut of 2.1% was imposed as a result of the June monitoring round. That re represented a cut of £13.5 million for the department. We're now coming through to the October monitoring round, and work is well advanced on that. The current indications are that that will produce a further 2.3% cut, resulting, therefore, uh, in a total cut over June and October of £29 million for the year. Now, that's bound to have an impact uh, in South Antrim, as indeed it will have in other constituencies, and it will also have an impact um, in a whole range of areas. If I just mention here 
the areas that uh, we've invested in in South Antrim in the year 13-14, uh, the last year. We invested in South Antrim uh, area, for example, on housing urban renewal, new social housing, £1.9 million, pounds. Um, planned maintenance services, £1.7 million, pounds. urban regeneration, £1.3 million, pounds. voluntary and community, 54000 and tackling disadvantage, £42,000. So you can see there that we spent uh, over that period um, in the region of um, £6 million. Pounds, um, but we are now faced with a very substantial cut there, right across the Department of 13.5, uh, and then adding on from that £29 million. Pounds. I call Mr Danny Kinahan for some. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. I'm glad to hear that there's £6 million spent in South Antrim, although that still seems very little. But will the Minister accept that the cuts to departmental budgets applied in the June monitoring were nothing to do with welfare reform, and in reality were predominantly to pay for executive commitments and the 20 million lifeline to health, and will you make sure that that is what the public knows? Well, the fact is that, as the member well knows, and as his party colleague on the executive knows, uh, because he's been party to the discussions there, um, and he has been part of the um, welfare uh, subcommittee within the executive, um, but going forward, there we're, we're quite clear. We're facing into a further 15 and a half million pounds, and we already know what the total cost of not proceeding with welfare reform is going to be. And it's not just the smaller figure that we're talking about at the moment, because we're getting up to the point where that's 200 million pounds a year in meeting the penalties as a result of welfare reform, on top of all of the other costs. And of course, there are people who think you should just invent your own IT system. Sure, a billion pounds to pay for something there, uh, to buy over a legacy system and operate that. That wouldn't be a problem for some people. Or 1.6 billion pounds to create a totally new bespoke system for Northern Ireland. That's not a problem for some people. And uh, the result is, in fact, that some members quite clearly are actually financially illiterate. I call Ms Meg Ferran. Perhaps the member would consider the adverse effect of not introducing welfare reform in Northern Ireland, an area I've already strayed into. It's important that we do consider that in relation to vulnerable people, by considering the previous answer on the budget cuts my department will have to make should we not have movement with welfare reform bill. DSD provides a range of services to vulnerable groups across Northern Ireland, and it will be some of the most vulnerable in our society. People in areas of deprivation and suffering from individual and family vulnerabilities, they will bear the brunt of this. Welfare reform will control the level or rate of the increase in social security spending. It's estimated that even after welfare reform, spending on social security benefits will be higher than that spent in 2010-11 rising from around £5 billion in 2011 to over £6 billion by 1819. Protecting the vulnerable is a key priority, and I have publicly expressed that while I support the reform of the welfare system, I have concerns with certain aspects of the welfare reform proposals as implemented in GV. I have listened to the debate in Great Britain about the impact on the most vulnerable, that's why I met with the Northern Ireland's four church leaders to discuss welfare reform in Northern Ireland, and why we also have ongoing engagement with a whole range of stakeholders. I'll continue to ensure that protecting the vulnerable is at the core of what I do. The reality is the welfare system needs to change to ensure it's fair, affordable and sustainable. In fact, plans to reform the welfare system have been ongoing since 2009, when a welfare bill was being considered. Since I've taken office, I've ensured that this welfare reform bill has been progressed against my four principles, which are central to the policy intent behind the legislation, namely protect the vulnerable, get people into work or back to work, develop a system that's fair and encourage personal and social responsibility. And as part of that, I developed a package of measures which include a series of flexibilities and transitional protections designed to meet the needs of the people in Northern Ireland 
That package of measures helps simplify the system, but more importantly, it ensures the vulnerable are protected. That was an important and detailed answer, but I remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. Thank you. And a comment. I think the Minister just made up his own question and answered a completely different question than I asked. But in light of a recent report um, actually issued by Queen's University that says over a quarter of adults in the North are living in multiple deprivation, and in light of the fact that the UN are now investigating Britain for human rights abuses against disabled people, Will the Minister join with us in defending the most vulnerable in our society against Tory cuts, which will only worsen already bad levels of deprivation in the North? Well, the member says I didn't ask the question she asked, because I actually answered her question and the question she doesn't want to ask. And the question her party doesn't want to ask, and her party doesn't want to face up to, the fact that Sinn Féin cuts when they are imposed, or if they are imposed, well, when they are imposed, and for the way we're going at the moment, when they're imposed, they will actually be detrimental to the most vulnerable, and there will be cuts that will be the result of the action, inner inaction of Sinn Féin and the SDLP. In terms of evidence, can I say there's also an increasing body of evidence, such as the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report on minimum income standard for the UK in 2014, and the Institute of Fiscal Studies report Green Budget 2014, which support the positive aspects of welfare reform and the introduction of universal credit, which will improve the financial reward for hard-working families and provide greater incentives for people to work. We need a system that encourages people into work, supports them in that regard, and is also there as a safety net for the most vulnerable. That's my task. I don't want to see the vulnerable punished because of the financial incapability of some others. I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers. Well Minister, when we talk about some of the most vulnerable in our society, um, we often think about those who have received disability benefits. Can I ask the Minister, um, under the, the new PIPs, um, how that will affect particularly children and older people? Um, the personal dependence payment will affect only working age claimants, those aged 16 to 64. Uh, so PIP won't affect the most vulnerable age groups, that's children under 16 or adults over 64. And individuals in these age groups will continue receiving their benefit as long as they satisfy the criteria. It's only when a child reaches their 16th birthday that they will be invited to make a claim to personal independence payment. A number of additional safeguards have been built into the PIP customer journey to ensure that vulnerable people in Northern Ireland receive particular, uh, all the help and support they need as they encounter a new benefit. And I continue to work with colleagues to ensure Northern Ireland is not adversely impacted by these changes. We're doing all we can in terms of getting flexibilities that I've negotiated with Westminster and putting together a package of other measures to mitigate the worst effects of welfare reform and protect the most vulnerable. I call Mr. Lawrence Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. You'll appreciate uh, the scepticism many of us have at this side of the House from a financially illiterate minister who stood not a few months ago and accused uh, some four contractors of 18 million overpayment if we have some concerns around his uh, way of and about of financial figures at the moment. But perhaps, perhaps the minister could give us a profile across each constituency of the impact, across those constituencies of the impact of welfare cuts. And it's unfortunate that he and his party have thrown the towel into the Conservatives in relation to the impact of these cuts. Well, now, there's always an opportunity to answer, Mrs. Kelly. That's always a privilege and a pleasure. First thing is to point out that it was her party, when they were in DSD, who started the process of implementing GB welfare reform in Northern Ireland. Oh, right. It's not just that uh, she doesn't mention that, she seems to have forgotten about it. I don't know, whether it's, I don't know what the reason is, but she obviously has forgotten about it. Uh, because it's one of a number of things that were uh, quietly forgotten about by Mrs Kelly. Um, secondly, in terms of doing things on a constituency basis, I think that in regard to welfare reform, what we've looked at generally is the impact on different categories of people. People, whether they are a particular age group of a particular um, Section 75 category, whatever, all of those things have been looked at. It hasn't really been done on an individual constituency basis. But um, it's clear that the um, work was done. In fact, the reason we had to do it was that if we were going to develop mitigations and flexibilities. You needed to know what the impact was in order to, uh, to develop those and negotiate them. So that work has been done and informed fully all of the conversations that we had with DWP, uh, with Ian Duncan Smith, uh, with David Freud and others, 
and uh, the, the work that was then done in developing local flexibilities and, and mitigations here in Northern Ireland. Sir Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder would the Minister explain why he does not bring the bill which he introduced two years ago back to the floor of this House for discussion uh, and that consideration stage table his package of proposals and allow other parties to do the same? The worst thing of all in many ways would be to bring legislation into the Assembly and then for that to fall we would be in a much more difficult situation even then uh, because you would almost be back to the drawing board and back to stage one and I can see his colleague beside him nodding in agreement. Um, the second thing is that we have two parties which have their faces set very firmly against maybe his head just nods. Um, the the, um, the uh, fact is there are two parties that are, are dead set against uh, any movement. They just seem to be like rabbits caught in the headlight. They're not quite sure what to do. Um, I don't want to see uh, us get into the situation. I don't want to see us get into that situation where we'd actually be worse off than we are now. Um, we have a good package. People are well aware of what's in it. It's been talked about enough. Um, everyone knows what's in it. I'm sure the, the member himself will be aware of, of the, the elements within that package. And um, I think it's, the real issue needs to be within the executive, where the representatives of their parties agree that this comes forward uh, as a Northern Ireland executive package. Uh, rather than uh, simply being put onto the floor and thrown out there. Um, we don't want to get a situation which would be worse than the current situation. Thank you. And I call Mr Sean Lynch. Kerr question five. My department is currently developing a number of projects in conjunction with other departments in neighbourhood renewal areas. These range from capital street enhancement schemes to revenue projects which address some of the barriers that contribute to low education attainment and poor health. These projects are being developed in conjunction with the Department of Regional Development, OFM, DFM, Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure and the Department of Education. There is uh, obviously a long uh, list of um, projects which would not really be um, possible to deal with in, in uh, an oral answer, um, but the, the, we work with all of those other departments on, on a range of measures. Well, Mr. Lynch for a supplement. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for what was a fairly short answer. But anyway, Minister, given that the transfer of neighbourhood renewal to local government, can you assure us that projects currently on the, on the way will not be impacted by a reduced budget? Well, the reason the answer was brief was that it was either going to be succinct and summary of the situation, or we get into a situation where I list all of the uh, projects that there are across all of the constituencies, and the, uh, we'd have been well past the two minutes set aside by the Speaker uh, to deal with, with uh, questions and answers. Um, the budget for uh, neighbourhood renewal and urban regeneration is being transferred uh, across, but I have to say this, uh, across to local councils. And we want to, and my department officials are, engaging thoroughly with local councils to make sure that uh, that process is as smooth and seamless as possible. Um, how councils then take forward those projects, how they decide to prioritise them, to stage them, to finance them, those are matters for councils themselves. And um, as of the 1st of April, um, if, if the regeneration and housing bill goes through, and I say if, because it hasn't gone through yet, then indeed it would be a matter for the local councillors. Commissioner Paul Given. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the meeting he had yesterday with representatives from the Reserve and Trust in my own constituency, and, and they are funded through a pilot scheme. Uh, can the Minister give an assurance that uh, there will be proactive work taken forward so that that particular scheme uh, doesn't fall through any cracks because it doesn't naturally fit with urban renewal and can he update the House on progress to try and introduce the regeneration and housing bill? Um, thank the member for his question. Uh, as he was at the meeting uh, and is aware, the um, work is ongoing between DSD officials and the officials in um, the um, new council area to, to make sure that 
uh, whatever happens moving forward is the best possible outcome. Um, he does also ask there in regard to the regeneration housing bill, and that's why I said earlier, if, because I've sought executive approval on a number of occasions to introduce the regeneration and housing bill in the Assembly. I made three attempts to table it at executive meetings on the 5th, 9th, and 8th, uh, 5th and 9th of June and the 8th of July. I also sought clearance by urgent procedure on the 9th and 29th, uh, 29th of July and 29th of August. However, I have been unable so far to make progress with this important piece of legislation because of the failure of some members of the executive to agree to the bill proceeding. This bill is essential in order to proceed with the transfer of functions and the conferral of powers to councils in April 2015, as agreed by the executive in April 2013. Um, the uh, bill was put uh, forward for the executive back in the spring. I've listed there the occasions on which I have attempted to table it, and I've sought clearance also by urgent procedure. Um, I also wrote out recently to all ministers asking for comment on it. And I got a reply from one minister who raised a whole range, it was the Cultural Arts and Leisure Minister, raised a whole range of issues now at a very late stage. I've responded to that. The letter came on the, uh, I wrote it on the 2nd of September. We got a reply there on the 8th. The reply has now gone back to all of those points. And I would hope that now we'll be able to move forward because councils are expecting that on the 1st of April, the powers will transfer, the functions rather will transfer. And um, if the legislation doesn't go through, well, nothing will transfer. <coughs> Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for his comprehensive answer that I've listened to very carefully. Can the Minister tell us uh, what endeavours he's had to submit his proposals for equality impact assessment, given that these new councils will be very quickly judged on their ability uh, to be fair in the distribution? Of, of their resources, and can he tell us what training the new shadow councils have, have undertaken to ensure that come the 1st of April they are in a position to do the job and do it correctly? Well, I think the member should have a conversation with his own minister. There is a role in, for the Department of the Environment as the lead department in terms of the reform of local government. So I would suggest that if he has concerns, and he obviously has, he take them up with a member of his own party because it's not a thing for me to deal with. And if the member doesn't even understand that, we are in a bad and sorry state. But clearly, this is something that his own minister should be dealing with. He should talk to him. If they don't talk to each other, I can't help that. Here and I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Thank the member for, for the question and for raising what is an important issue in regard to fuel poverty. Fuel poverty in Northern Ireland has three core contributors income, energy prices, and energy efficiency of homes. Unlike other regions of the UK, a primary reason for high levels of expenditure in Northern Ireland is the prominence of oil as a source of domestic heating fuel. In 2009, it was estimated that 44% of households were experiencing fuel poverty. According to the 2011 House Condition Survey, that figure is currently 42%. This is based on households needing to spend 10% or more of their income on household fuel costs. Research has also highlighted 33,000 households across Northern Ireland needing to spend 25% or more of their income to adequately heat their home. Whilst the proportion of households in fuel poverty has reduced slightly, without the measures delivered by my department, the rates of fuel poverty would be significantly higher. And this underlines my commitment to assisting the most vulnerable households in Northern Ireland by providing measures to reduce their energy costs and maximise the energy efficiency of their homes. There have been 120,000 homes with energy efficiency measures installed under the current Warm Home Scheme, investing over £150 million and over 14,500 old inefficient boilers have been replaced in the Boiler Replacement Scheme. I will shortly launch a new energy efficiency scheme that will be a targeted area-based approach. This will find and target the most vulnerable homes, those where people live in the severe fuel poverty and offer energy efficiency assistance to them. There's no doubt that more work could be done in tackling fuel poverty. However, I am restricted to the work that can be done within allocated budgets. I can assure the member I'm committed to working in a collaborative and inclusive way. And I'm always keen to explore all options and new initiatives to provide assistance to those most vulnerable households. I do chair the Cross-Sectoral Fuel Poverty Partnership, 
and I also work closely with my colleague in Dete, uh, Arlene Foster. But the cross-sectoral fuel poverty partnership does not simply have government departments that are relevant to this, but also a range of stakeholders that work in the area of fuel poverty. Two minutes rule again, Mr. <laughs> Vickers. Reminding Mrs. Joanne Dobson for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his very detailed and lengthy answer? Um, but does the Minister accept that despite all the policies, all the wholehearted words of support from his department, the impact on families in fuel poverty has been negligible? And does he really think a 2% drop of re over recent years is good enough? Furthermore, um, what more could he have done to meet key departmental targets? Well, the, the point I made at the start was that there are three main contributors which I identified to fuel poverty. Um, first one there is the, is the really big issue in Northern Ireland, and that is the heavy <coughs> dependence we have on domestic heating fuel, um, uh, uh, avoid being a domestic uh, fuel. The, the, the issue there is so different from that in GB, and that's why it's so important, uh, the work that's been taken forward by my daddy colleague, Arnie Foster, in terms of expanding the gas, gas network to the West. Um, the more people that can have access to gas, then you have a cheaper fuel. That's the sort of thing that will have uh, the, the, the biggest uh, impact. The other thing we do, which I think uh, I, I didn't really mention there, was in terms of income. Our benefit uptake campaigns have a significant impact on uh, the ability of people to pay for fuel, because that's the third factor, the level of income. Um, I would also say the uh, work we're doing at the moment, the targeted approach, is a particularly innovative one. And uh, the academic that we're working with on that, Professor Christine Liddell, is really at the forefront of that. And it's actually uh, leading the way, I would say, within the British Isles in that regard. Call Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister why has the de decrease in levels of fuel poverty not been more significant? Um, fuel poverty has those three factors, income, fuel cost and energy efficiency. The major focus of my department's fuel poverty strategy is to remove energy um, inefficiency as a cause of fuel poverty, because that is the one contributor to fuel poverty which we really can do something about. We can talk about tackling the price of fuel, um, and that's important, and, and the, the introduction of gas to a wider area is important. We can talk about improving household incomes, but we really can do something about improving energy efficiency. And certainly, I would say to the member, within the social housing stock, um, we've done a tremendous amount of work there uh, in relation to um, introducing, by the end of this um, financial year, we will have all of the uh, housing executive properties double glazed. We will also, by the end of this year, be in a much better position regarding uh, the energy efficiency of uh, the no fines homes, the thousands of those in the housing executive stock which have no cavity wall and no cavity wall insulation. And that's an issue that's been around for a decade and more, for, in fact, for several decades. But really, there's been a lot of denial about it over the past decade. We're actually dealing with the issue now, and that, again, will make a difference. Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I think it's, it's pretty shocking that um, a third of people um, are being expected to pay more than a quarter of their income to adequately heat their homes. And I think we deserve better from the Minister than simply listing the, the three causes of fuel poverty. And the Minister says we can talk about increasing household income, but really what he's talking about doing is cutting household income because he wants to cut the basic rate of welfare for people and he wants to impose heinous sanctions on people. So can I ask the Minister how he ties the two together? You're talking about increasing household income to tackle fuel poverty, but at the same time you want to take out hundreds of millions of pounds out of the most vulnerable households in our society. Well, could I encourage the member then to ensure that in future, when these issues are being debated at Westminster, he ensures that the members of his party, instead of running away from the issue, are actually in their seats in Westminster, doing their job and representing the people of Northern Ireland. Then he might have something to talk about, and then he might be in a position to comment on others. A bit of tight order. Order. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. I really only have time to take the question, and the minister will possibly respond to him. Right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. A side, a side issue, and uh, 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 just one that is, uh, my attention has been drawn to. And is the minister aware of what may amount to a warm home scheme scam? where individuals are pre presenting themselves at households, purporting to represent the scheme, doing undefined works, demanding money. And if he is, what advice would he give to householders who may find themselves confronted in such a way? 
member has information regards that, I would encourage him to bring that to uh, my attention. And I'm sure he'll also want to bring that to the attention of the police as well, to have that matter uh, properly investigated. Whatever information he has, I would certainly be interested to hear about. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Members. Uh, that ends the period for oral questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr Jim Allister. A year ago it was announced that a fact-finding investigation was being conducted into the alleged attempted intimidation by the Minister's Special Advisor of Councillor Jenny Palmer. Why is that report buried in the Department and where is it buried and has it resulted or will it result in the implementation of any disciplinary proceedings? Well, I thank the member for his question. The member is, uh, of course, also a member of the Social Development Committee and would therefore, I assume, be aware that uh, on the uh, 8th of this month, the other day there, the chair of the committee did write to me in regard to that very issue. Um, he asked for a reply within 10 days. That reply will be within, with the committee within the next 10 days and the member will receive the fulsome answer along with the other members of the committee. Mr. Alistair, for a supplementary. Is the Minister not being disrespectful to the House by refusing to provide information which he clearly holds? Should he not reflect upon that, or is he trying to conceal it from the House? And could he tell us, has the promised apology to Councillor Palmer been issued, and if not, why not? Well, first of all, it would be disrespectful, I think, to the committee insofar as I've received a letter here from the chair of the committee, and uh, I will give that information within the 10 days to the committee. Um, the, the response is being prepared and drafted up at the moment, so I think it's important to respect the committee, having received the letter from the chair. Uh, the other matter is uh, a matter that is uh, outside uh, the... Uh, remit of the, the particular question that the member um, originally raised. He moves on to something else there, but I would say this about it. I would say this about it. Um, the issue is one there that is a personnel issue, and that is something that will have to influence our uh, dealings with it and the way in which it's handled, because I'm sure the, the member is aware that uh, there are rules and regulations and procedures that have to be in place when you're dealing with personnel issues. But as I say, the, the matter will be uh, with the committee within the next number of days. Thank you. Uh, and just before I call the, uh, the next topical question, can I remind members that uh, you know, they should ask a single question? Can I clearly focus on that? And uh, the same goes for supplementary. And they should mem members should remember that the minister can choose which element of a line of question they're going to respond to. They have that discretion. So it's one question and it should be clearly focused in the, the discourse. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I do apologise to the Minister because this is on a similar vein. Uh, however, it's slightly more personal. Uh, Minister, have you spoken to Councillor Jenny Palmer since the media reports this morning? Um, she obviously does feel cheated and let down by your department. And... Um, uh, I was curious to know if any approaches had been made to her because they were made previously, which is how we got here. Um, can I simply say I didn't hear the news item this morning. I was actually uh, preparing for the executive committee meeting this morning. I was also preparing for oral questions today. So that and other matters to my attention, I haven't actually heard that, so I can't comment on it. Mr. Copeland, for a supplement. Uh, thank you again, Minister. And uh, following on from Mr. Alistair, could you confirm? If at any stage the, your, the findings of your department and particularly the DFP internal inquiry will be made public? I think the member would be aware of the rules that there are dealing with uh, matters of personnel. Personnel issues are not matters that uh, are handled in the same way as certain other things. And I'm sure he'd bear that in mind in asking for that question. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fran McCann. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And, uh, how would the, the Minister uh, characterise his relationships with the Scrutiny uh, Committee after his attack on the integrity of the committee yesterday? I want to ensure that uh, the committee does its job properly, and uh, that's a matter, of course, that's primarily the role of the chair of the committee. I think it was perfectly right and proper to say that a flawed <coughs> process had produced a flawed product. And I would also encourage the committee, as I did yesterday, 
to address the big issues that actually face us at the present time. And I listed a number of those yesterday, issues that we're dealing with in terms of things like fuel poverty, about the uh, standard of maintenance in social housing properties uh, owned by the housing executive, in all of the other areas that we're working in, the energy efficiency, the boiler replacement, uh, in terms of antisocial behaviour and all of the other issues, I would like to see uh, more product from the uh, committee in that regard, but uh, sadly so much of their time has been taken up on uh, what is, uh, I think, a pointless diversion. Mr. McCann, for Thank you uh, very much. Uh, pre last con I noticed that the Minister completely dodged the, the, the question uh, that, that I asked. But does he not accept that the role of the committee is absolutely essential, essential for its accountability role and, uh, uh, and keeping both ministers and officials uh, and keeping them to account? certainly wouldn't want to dodge Mr McCann. Um, the, the, the fact is that this assembly functions best, as indeed does any legislature anywhere in the British Isles. It functions best when you have all of the different elements working together. Uh, and I think that that's why I did emphasise yesterday and why I emphasised again this afternoon the important role that the um, committee has in addressing, considering, bringing forward ideas, recommendations on the sort of issues that really do matter to the people of Northern Ireland. And those are the things, as I say, I've already listed there. Um, so I would encourage the committee to consider those, to reflect on them. Um, there are key areas of work. I've taken a simple example. Um, we had some proposals regarding antisocial behaviour. The committee had contrary views on them. But when I actually asked for, well, what do you think would be the best way to tackle it? There wasn't anything forthcoming. You are going to call Mr. David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister to update the House today, please, on the programme that his department launched uh, called Building Successful Communities? Well, I am glad to say that all of the Building Successful Community Regeneration Forums have now been established in the six pilot areas across Northern Ireland Dury Road and Ballymena. In Belfast, Lower Falls, Lenadoon, and Glen Collin, uh, and also then Tigers Bay, Mount Collier, Lower Shankill and Brown Square, and then Lower Old Park and Hillview, so six in all. Dury Road, Lenadoon, Glen Collin, uh, and also then Lower Falls, those three were established in April and May. Tigers Bay, Mount Collier, Lower Shankill and Brown Square, Lower Old Park and Hillview have all had their first meeting within the last four weeks. All of these meetings today have been positive and constructive, and that's an encouraging start. And each forum's membership has embraced the challenges ahead in attempting to use housing as a spearhead for physical, social, and economic regeneration. Each forum includes representatives from the local community who will uh, consider the redevelopment plans for the area, as well as representatives from statutory sectors, uh, statutory bodies, and elected representatives. And work is ongoing at the moment to appoint the consultants who will work with the forums. And I'm hoping that um, the individual action plans um, will be in place in the new year with action plans to follow um, during 2015. We're having a seminar on the 17th of September. Um, I'll open the seminar and that will feature keynote addresses from people who have experiences in this field, um, from the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, from Urban Regeneration and from the Wheatley Group in Glasgow. And that will be attended by forum members from all of the six areas. Mr. Michael Veen for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his answer. And indeed, I'm glad he made mention of the Dury Road scheme in my own constituency. Uh, Minister, I've had the privilege of attending a number of the meetings so far, and I can say without, um, with certainty that the buy-in from both the statutories and the community um, has been excellent and, and certainly very encouraging. I wonder, Minister, could you just advise us um, in relation to these programmes, what is the benchmark of success? What is the end game uh, and the hope to achieve for disadvantaged areas such as the Dury Road in Ballymena? Well, Building Successful Communities was an attempt, and is an attempt, to address the difficulties, the needs in areas where the regeneration programs that have been in place for a number of years, in fact for the past decade, haven't really made the impact that, that is required. Um, and within the pilot areas, there will be a range of initiatives brought forward, but at the end of the day, what will be the evidence of success? A regenerated community. That's what the people in those areas want to see. They don't want to see dereliction. They don't want to see derelict properties. They don't want to see blight. 
they feel a sense of despair and therefore this is something I think that gives them an opportunity for hope and progress and we have around the table that's the key thing with us all of the relevant players the relevant departments agencies local people local elected representatives everybody there saying we know this area we either live in it or we work in it or we work with it these are the things that will make a difference what the outcome will be in each area in terms of a program will be different but the end result has to be vibrant communities places where people want to live work and socialize thank you um, mr sammy wilson is not in his place so i call mr patsy mcglone order Hi. <laughs> Uh, I got a free last year on call you. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, I noted from reading the newspapers this morning that 20 organisations have come together to uh, highlight the shortcomings of the racial equality strategy, particularly uh, saying that it needs to be much more ambitious, far-reaching, and robust. And in that context, I asked the minister what his department is doing with the likes of the Housing Association movement and the Northern Ireland Housing Executive to address the need that there is among many sections of the community, particularly I think of the Leck family in Money Moore, who were intimidated out of their home, to, to see what work has been done through his department to address those issues of intimidation of minority and ethnic communities in our midst. It is a family that I have got to know very, very well in the last two three years, good, decent people. And those are people whom we must accommodate and look after. And I would like to hear the Minister's comments about what more his department could be doing in that regard. Um, first of all, um, I don't personally know the details of that particular family in, in Money Moore um, in, in detail. But what I would say, of course, is that um, in this or in any other situation where people are being intimidate, intimidated because of their religion, their race, or whatever, that should not happen. It's wrong. It hardly needs just to say it, but it is right to say it. But it's something that everybody, I think, should sign up to, that it is wrong, even without saying it. I'm putting on record today, it's wrong. It shouldn't happen. Uh, and it's something that happens in uh, a number of areas. The, the reasons are different in different cases. In some cases, they are communal. In some cases, they're individual. The whole range of circumstances. But could I say that the housing executive, uh, I think, does have um, a good record in trying to help people in those circumstances. Um, there is a limit to what the housing executive can do. They are simply one player in this. Of course, the fact is that uh, you have others uh, involved. The, the police have a role to play uh, if there are issues of intimidation to make sure that the perpetrators are brought before the courts and dealt with appropriately. Um, the community around very often will come to give their support to those who are the targets uh, of intimidation. So it, it, it's very difficult to come up with a single answer of say A, B, C, D and E are the five things that need to happen. It will depend on the circumstances, but I would assure the member that the housing executive, as I'm sure he would expect, and the housing executive does keep this uh, very much uh, in mind. And I think that their uh, community cohesion union also uh, does good work in trying to create more cohesive communities where this sort of thing doesn't happen. Call Mr. McGlone for supplement. Thanks very much to the Minister. But he himself highlighted the question that I was asking and he did not respond to it. Essentially, what I wanted to know was what was his department doing, the ABCs and Ds of his department, what you were doing at, at a, a progressive level to work with those agencies and bodies to ensure that a strategy is developed to make sure that people are made feel at home and are accommodated in this part of the world? Um, if the issue is, for example, one of racial uh, tension between groups or between individuals, and people are being targeted because of, of their ethnic background, um, that is not um, an issue that can be left solely at my responsibility. In actual fact, OFM, DFM has responsibility for racial equality. So there are a number of different departments simply to say that what is DSD doing? We work through the housing executive in terms of the housing aspect of the issue. But there are obviously wider issues there. Now, that's a matter then I think maybe needs to be looked at. It's a bit like the, the question from another member of the SDLP. It's important the question is directed to the appropriate person, appropriate minister and the appropriate department. Well, 
I did say the housing executive, which is one of our department's uh, bodies, does have a role. I did say that. Time is up. Uh, and then